I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 25, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 30. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to read verses 14 through 30. This is the parable of the talents, the parable of the talents, starting at verse 14 of chapter 25. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master." He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for this text that comes from your servant Matthew, and I thank you that, that we have this passage to be able to reflect on and, and be instructed concerning today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather here today and to be able to worship, and I pray, Father, that as we examine this text, that we would evaluate it in the context of commitment. Father, we have opportunities that are given to us, that we are stewards entrusted with things from you and how awesome of a responsibility it is and how sad it is when we waste opportunity to be productive for you. I thank you, Father, that we have opportunity and I just pray, Father, that you would give us wisdom and discernment, that you would cause a fire to burn deep within us, that we would desire to be productive servants for you so that we can hear those marvelous words one day, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Father, I just pray that you would be with our missionaries who are serving you across the globe. I pray that you would empower them, that you would, that you would give them boldness, that they would be um, eager to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Father, you would put a hedge of protection around them, that you would allow them to serve for your glory. We commit our, uh, th those who are serving you abroad, we commit them to you and ask for your richest blessing. Father, I think of, uh, of those who are dealing with uh, physical issues within our body and just pray for your blessing upon them. I draw, ask that you would draw them unto yourself and that, Father, they would sense in a very real way your presence in their lives. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to connect with them through our live stream. And just pray that this time that we spend gathered around your word would be profitable. Father, I pray that I would in no way be an inhibition to what it is that you have for us to learn today. I just pray that you would speak clearly 
uh, through me that, uh, Father, the, the, what you have prepared, that I would uh, speak with clarity and in fluidity, and that, Father, we would just uh, not emerge from this study together unchanged persons. Thank you once again for the gospel, and thank you for the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, and just pray that you would uh, give us a, a wonderful time right now as we study together, for it is in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, for any of you that uh, had the chance to talk with me in close quarters and, um, and maybe shook my hand, uh, don't worry about my very red eye that I have. I've been taking antibiotics for a week and uh, just switched over to a stronger one because it seems that the bacterial infection that I have isn't going away. In fact, as I look at all of you and look down here, I'm seeing a lot of blurry. So uh, bear with me. Uh, that's, just, uh, that's just the hand that I've, I've been dealt, and I'm sure I'll see you all clearly at some point. Maybe today it's a good thing. I don't know. Listen, we have a text before us, and uh, this is the third and final installment of our mini-series concerning the church. Uh, can anyone tell me what the operative word has been for the last two weeks, and will be the operative word today? What is that word? Commitment. Commitment, commitment absolutely. It is commitment. We, we, uh, we, we started off in week one considering a commitment to grow. A commitment to grow, a commitment to grow in Christ, that a healthy church is committed to growing. A healthy church, those who love the Lord Jesus Christ are going to find every opportunity that they can to be enriched by God's word, to be instructed by it, to sit under uh, um, appropriate teaching and to and to look eagerly for ways to apply God's word to their own lives so they can live for his glory. Similarly, we know that a, uh, a, a, uh, a healthy church is going to not only grow in Christ, but they're going to grow in relationship to one another. And I encouraged you last week saying, uh, Calvary Bible Church, just as Dan Merklin, I want to echo his sentiments, it is a family. In fact, there's scriptural uh, support for that. We are a family of God. We are, a, uh, we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and we are part of a body. Christ is the head. So, yes, uh, I want to encourage you that when, them, when brothers and sisters are suffering, it's almost as if we have to uh, lovingly say, uh, please hold back a little bit. It's uh, your love and your care and your desire to reach out and encourage is almost overwhelming. And so thank you so much um, because I see evidence uh, of that. Today we want to consider this, commitment to give. Commitment to give. They've said that one of the responsibilities of a pastor is to fleece the flock. I'm not here to fleece you and, and, and demand your money. That's not what we're talking about. Giving has so much more to do with than, than mere money, than, than that. Though I will tell you it is a part of it, and it is an important part of it. But there's more to this, and this parable provides for us a really good opportunity to apply some important principles as it involves a commitment to give. A committed assembly of believers is going to understand the immeasurable gift of salvation that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we ought to live, according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, as living sacrifices. Because of the sacrifice that Christ made, we ought to live our lives willing to, to sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom. It's our only acceptable worship to Him. We give ourselves entirely as worship. Our hearts to Christ the exercise of our spiritual gifts within the body, our abilities, which are not to be equated with spiritual gifts, but our abilities, our talents, and our material resources all for His glory. In those contexts, we give, we give, we give. And it's one of the evidences, I believe, of genuine salvation is the eagerness on the part of the, 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 uh, the saved person to want to give. They just can't 
get enough of the opportunity. They want more opportunity. They keep wanting to know, how can I give? How can I give? How can I give? Because that's, that's worship, you see. So here we have this key word, give. And let's frame our one statement that's going to drive the rest of this brief message for today. A healthy church is eager to give. give. A healthy church is eager to give. Now Jesus' parables were, were stories that were cast alongside a truth in order to illustrate that truth. That's what a parable is. It's something that is story that is cast alongside a truth. Teaching aids which serve as extended analogies or inspired comparisons. Some have said that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And this is what we have. Listen, we are all stewards. We are all stewards. Like the servants of this parable, we've been entrusted with something by our Master. Just as they were entrusted with with finances by their Master, we are entrusted with something from our Master. And one day, there will be a reckoning. We'll, We'll need to give an account. Of that which has been entrusted to us, we'll need to give an account to the Master. And we'll give an account to Him of how we have handled what has been entrusted to our care. How have we handled our lives in Christ? How have we handled the material things that we have? How have we handled the opportunities that we've been given to be productive within the body? All of this is what we're talking about here. There will be a reckoning and we will, we will, we will have to give an account just as those three servants gave an account to the Master. A key theme in this parable is this. It's the tragedy of wasted opportunity. The tragedy of wasted opportunity. And so I have two, I've I've observed two contrasts or two principles in this parable. And they are instructive as we consider the importance of giving in the church. Here is a contrast or principle number one. Risk versus safety. Risk versus safety. And as you can see here, Christianity is is not about safety. Christianity is about risk. It's about risk. Look at the text. Verse 16. Chapter 25, Matthew 25, verse 16. Let's back up to, to verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Verse 16, He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So he who had the two talents made two talents more. So what we have here is is we see illustrated with this story that's cast alongside truth, we see this illustrated. That the, the two servants, the first servant was given five talents, he went and he made five more. The second servant was given two and he made two more. What can we conclude? They didn't play it safe. They didn't play it safe. The third servant took his one talent and he went and he buried it in the ground and he played it safe. That's number one. The the principle of risk versus safety. Now just as a little aside, a talent was a, a, a measure of weight. One talent, it could be said, was about 20 years' wages. And so if someone was entrusted with five talents, that was a, all you need to understand, in today's currency, if you were to translate it, could have been perhaps in the multi-millions of dollars. So the bottom line here is that it was a considerable sum of money. To be given one talent, 20 years' wages, but to be given five, and then two, and then to double a return, meant that they had to take a risk. They sought to honor the departed master by taking what was given to them and boldly seeking a return on the master's funds. Their efforts were successful, and the master praised them and rewarded them when it was time to settle accounts. As we saw in the text, well done, good and faithful servant. What did he say? You have been entrusted With little, now I can trust you with much. Let's think about this as it applies to the church. 
risk versus safety. In the faith, we are not promised comfort. In the faith, we are not promised ease. In the faith, we are not even promised safety. And I just think back to the early church, and I think of first century Christians. And I compare that to 20, 21st century Christianity. Let's just call it evangelicalism in America today. And what a contrast that we have between risk and safety. I mean, the risk in the first century was of one's life. The risk in the first century was separation of head from shoulders. The, sep- the, the risk in the first century was, was separation from family. The risk in the first century was so intense. And, and, and sometimes I, I wonder if the expectation is of comfort and of safety and of ease. And if that is not part of the problem in creating apathetic Christians today. So there's the whole principle of risk versus safety. We are called to be salt and light in our homes. Sometimes that means taking a risk. There may be people who are unequally yoked. Maybe you have a spouse who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe you have a spouse who is a professing believer, but they're struggling and they don't want to hear it right now. There's risk involved in that. Maybe it's not even a spouse. Let's go to extended family and maybe you've got siblings who, who, uh, who, who are not professing and maybe they need to hear. There's risk involved in that. So the Christianity is, is about risk. How about at our jobs? What about at the playground where you've got playdates arranged for your kids or maybe at ball games that you attend for any of our kids? We are called to be salt and light and being salt and light isn't a safe venture necessarily, but it involves risk taking. Here's the, here's the idea here. We have to be willing to face down our fears as we share the good news with people. Sometimes that means facing down our fears. We should give sacrificially to kingdom work. Sometimes that also involves facing down our fears because we wonder, how is it that I can give time that I actually don't have? How is it that I can give finances that I'm actually struggling to reconcile in my books? Christianity involves risk, not safety. We should lend our energy to sharing the good news and building one another up in the faith. The Master, Jesus Christ, is temporarily away. He is coming back again. Just as the Master in the parable came back and settled the counts, the Master, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming back again. And in the meantime, as we wait, we don't take seats and wait for His return. While we wait, we are working. We work while we wait. And we watch. And we want to be productive in doing so. So that like the first two servants, we can hear it said, Well done, good and faithful servant. When he returns, we should want more than anything to hear that. And the only way we will is if we've been fruitful with what he has given us, what he has entrusted to our care. And so we can't play it safe as the third servant untrustingly does when he goes and he buries what his master gave to him. He's condemned for fearing the master and being afraid to risk for his master. Christianity is not about safety. It is about risk. The second principle that I see here is uh, the principle of being faithful versus unfaithful. We, we see a theme here, the tragedy of wasted opportunity, and the tragedy of wasted opportunity can be attributed to unfaithfulness. Faithful versus unfaithful. The three servants of the parable fall into two categories. Three servants, two categories. Two can be categorized as faithful. One is categorized as unfaithful. Stewardship. We've thrown this word around a bit already. What is stewardship? Well, it's the care and the management of that which belongs to another. They were charged with stewardship. They were charged to be stewards. They were to take what the master had given. They were entrusted with it. 
that was placed in their care until he returns. Listen, here's the application. Nothing, nothing is ours. Nothing. Our physical life is not ours. Our children that we hold near and dear to our heart and we love so much are not ours. What we have in terms of physical resources is not ours. The good health that we may be enjoying right now is not ours. Nothing is ours. Everything belongs to God. And so if we would take that perspective, then it would help us to understand better the whole principle of stewardship. In fact, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He's speaking to the Corinthians. What do you have that you did not receive? In other words, everything that we have comes from Almighty God. We have received our lives and everything in them for which we are responsible, and until God requires them from us, we are stewards of these gifts from Him. Biblical stewardship calls us to use all of our resources in the way the Lord wants. And that means to use them for His glory. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment and say that this is a very familiar parable. And yet I was shocked in, in, in my research to find the discrepancy among scholars concerning the interpretation here, especially as it relates to the unfaithful servant. Is the unfaithful servant saved? A regenerated Christian? One who is genuinely saved but unproductive in his life? Uh, who is rebuked by the Master for his laziness? And therefore, blessing is withheld? Warren Wearsby says so. Or, or is, is the unfaithful servant unmasked? when the master returns and finds that he has been unproductive, who, who is then sentenced to eternal judgment, the context being the previous parables, the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the ten virgins. Is the unfaithful stir, servant un, un, unsaved and, and therefore receives eternal judgment and cast into the outer darkness? Well, it's hard to, to develop a theology on parables. Because they are truths cast alongside, they are stories cast alongside truth. It could be both. I lean towards MacArthur, but I could also see how, the, how because it's true, that we in our own Christian lives fall into ruts in our living. We fall into little divots, right? We get tripped up. We've traditionally called this backsliding. And, and there are plenty of, of genuine Christians, I think, for at least a, a time who are genuinely, for whatever reason, unproductive. Here's the principle, though. It's very important that as believers in Jesus Christ, that we be good stewards of what He has entrusted to us, which is everything, because nothing we have is actually ours, and we need to be productive, and we need to fight the urge to be unproductive, maybe due to laziness, or maybe due to apathy, or maybe due to the fact that we're jaded because of our circumstances. The bottom line here is that we are expected to be productive Christians at work for the Father's kingdom. Here are the contrasts I see. According to verses 16 and 17 and verses 20 through 23, I see a few lessons concerning faithful servants. We know that he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. They doubled up the, the, master's, the master's finances. That was a 100% return on investment. Good in any era. Verse 20, And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And really the same response was given to the second servant who doubled up the master's money. Faithful, here's, here's, here's uh, truth number one, I believe. Faithful stewards 
are disciplined. Faithful stewards are disciplined. Without discipline, the best intentions to use our time, our talent, our treasure for the gospel will be overwhelmed by circumstances. You know this to be true. A lot of times if we're undisciplined and we don't have a very clear set priority of of how it is that we are going to give to the Master's Kingdom work, circumstances, whether that be runaway inflation, whether that be uh, a, a monopolization of our time, whether that be any circumstance in our life, Whatever is most pressing in that moment for the undisciplined steward is going to be uh, pressing and take priority over what it is that we decide to do. So if we have a, a disciplined outlook as stewards, then it doesn't really matter what the circumstances are. We're going to be driven toward glorification of the Master. And because we understand that Christianity is about risk and not safety all the more reason why we're going to be driven in that direction. When a person eagerly begins to use their resources to serve and to spread the gospel, it reflects the value that they place upon the gospel and the fact that Christ is treasured in their life more than anything else. Number two, faithful stewards are productive. The faithful servants took their talents, not their abilities. This parable of the talents is, is about a, a weight of measurement concerning money. It doesn't have to do with abilities. But when they took their talents, meaning the sum that the Master gave them, they put it to work for the Lord. And they each received the same commendation. So church, are we eager to serve the body? Are we eager to give? Service to the Master can evidence genuine salvation. Listen to what the Apostle Paul also said. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Paul understood the gravity of the situation. What a tone at the right moment in time. I agree. That was a profound statement by the Apostle Paul. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Number three, faithful stewardship is evident. In other words, we can call it observable. It's observable. How? Well, faithful stewardship can actually be seen as as good stewards who prioritize their time. They'll, They'll do the simple thing. They'll gather together with the saints for worship. They will will make the gathering of the saints together a priority. They'll be eager to use their spiritual gifts to serve God within the body. And I hear people say, well, I don't don't know what my spiritual gift is. Okay, That's, that's understood. Jump in, get to work, seek to be productive, and God is going to reveal to you where your spiritual gift is. But if you never seek to get engaged, then you're never going to know what that is, quite likely. Offering our skills to promote progress. I can just look around this room and know that there are folks within this body who have requisite skills to be able to do certain things and we enjoy the benefits of them applying their skills. And we could go through many different aspects of a church's ministry and and make those kinds of observations as well. Designating a portion of our money for the church each month. A good steward does that, listen, before paying other bills. Here's what happens when we wait and we do that after the bills are paid. Oh, shoot, I don't think I have enough to give to the Lord. Listen. Faithful stewards, good stewardship means you are already giving that before the bills are paid because the priority, it's highest for that. You're giving to the Lord first. That's what first fruits is. It's not if I have enough when all is said and done. It's we give it at the beginning. And so, I would like to make a very specific charge to this body 
to pray. Good stewardship at Calvary Bible Church. Let's just take it in terms of finances. We have a general fund. We're going to have a, 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 a business meeting at the conclusion of this service. And um, you're going to, Jim Phillips is going to go over the budget. But it's, it's understood here, and for those of you who are members of Calvary Bible Church, you know that we have undesignated giving, which goes to the general fund. And that, that is used to pay for all of those, those things that are ex- considered expenses here in the operations of a local church fellowship. Whether that be utility costs, whether that be uh, a, a personnel costs, whether that be ministry costs, all of those things, that falls under the category of undesignated giving. And we have a missions budget here uh, that needs to be supported as well. And that missions budget is dependent upon faithful giving of people being good stewards. That is above and beyond the undesignated giving. And then we have those things that require attention. Because as stewards who are working for the Lord and for the advancement of His kingdom, needs... You can look at it as either a blessing or a curse, what we have in the 21st century. We have this building. On the one hand, it's a blessing. On the other hand, it's a curse. Because we need to maintain it. I'll never forgive a poor elder who pulled a pillow off of an exposed electrical uh, outlet and also an electric baseboard heater. We were set. I'm just kidding, of course. But listen, we've been entrusted with the care of these facilities. And this is where we have our moving and our being. And this is where we can minister to other, others. This is where the Calvary Bible Christian homeschoolers can meet. This is where our music ministry comes and, and meets for the edification of the body. This is where Koinonia meets. This is where uh, we have the men's breakfast. It meets. This is where women of Calvary meet. We've been entrusted with these f- facilities. And we have facilities that are in need of attention. And we have a liability in a parking lot out there. And by God's grace, we have an opportunity to pave the parking lot within the next few weeks. And, and, and from soliciting multiple bids, we understand that the, the cost to do so actually fits within the, the funds that we have available that's on hand, which we didn't, we didn't realize. But listen, that's not it. We have, we have other things that have to be addressed as well, and it requires the faithful giving of us. So I'm asking you to prayerfully consider how it is, when you hear about this in the coming weeks, how it is that you could give beyond your undesignated giving and beyond your missions budget giving towards capital improvement projects that are on the horizon here at the church. That we are blessed to be able, to, because of faithful giving, Uh, God's provision that we are able to address these things that are very real. Because you don't want people coming into our facilities and tripping and knocking their head on concrete before they even walk in the door and hear the gospel message. So these things are real. And I want to encourage you to pray of how you can participate to this end. Unfaithful stewards are poor stewards. Unfaithful servants are poor stewards. They can be poor stewards. Unfaithful stewards are undisciplined. Good intentions don't make faithful servants. You have to follow through on the intention. Intentions may be good, but if there's no follow through, nothing has happened. And so we know that undisciplined servants are those who don't prioritize their giving because their heart is not invested in Christ. And so we don't want to be that way. Giving, again, not just in terms of finances. I'm talking about giving in the context of all. I mean giving heart. I mean giving time. I mean giving resources. I mean giving abilities that we have for the sake of the kingdom. The undisciplined servant invests in what is appealing or what is pressing at that time. But the disciplined servant is going to give towards that which is the highest priority first. And so we want to challenge ourselves 
in this way. The un- unfaithful stewards are lazy. Unfaithful stewards are lazy. Why do I say that? It sounds like I'm just really drawing a hard line here. Well, actually, I'm not saying it. The master said it. Here's what the master said. If we look at verses 25 and 26, the, the, uh, the one servant, the wicked servant he called him, came and presented the one talent that he went and buried in the ground. He dug it up and he brought it to the master. And he said, um, uh, Master, I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. You see, he wasn't willing to take a risk. He was willing to do that which was safe. I hid it in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. In other words, you're lazy. You wicked and slothful servant. The unfaithful servant hid his talent in the ground, and instead of using his opportunities, he buried them. He buried his opportunity. That is the tragedy of wasted opportunity. It was a tragedy. And he was unfaithful, and therefore he was unrewarded. Unfaithful stewardship, just like faithful stewardship, is identifiable. It is identifiable. You can see it. Unfaithful stewardship can be seen in spotty attendance at worship services, Sunday school, other functions of the body. Unfaithful stewards can be seen in in a reluctance to serve the body, a refusal to give of one's abilities, a refusal or, or reluctance to exercise our spiritual gifts, perhaps no tithing or inconsistent financial giving. What keeps us from being faithful stewards? Well, it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. And if we remember, as I said from the very outset, that it is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of of determined and settled priorities. If Christ is indeed King, if He is Lord of our life, if He is Master, as the Master in the parable represents, then nothing is going to take the place of the Lord Jesus Christ in the work that He wants to do in and through His local fellowship. This one. And so it starts with a, a proper perspective. An unfaithful servant who is unmasked as a hypocrite, who is fruitless, will suffer eternal judgment, it says, according to verse 30. Or an unfaithful servant who mismanages the master's resources will be rebuked and see blessing withheld. Whether the unfaithful servant is an, is an unregenerate sinner, one who professes but doesn't really believe, that is eternal condemnation that is awaiting. Or whether that be an unfaithful servant who, who may not be willing to exercise for whatever reason because they're knocked off of the pathway and there's a little bit of backsliding perhaps that goes on, well, they, they will be rebuked and they may see blessing withheld. Either way, this is not where we want to be. The servants were charged with preparing for the master's return. How do we, church, prepare for the master's return? How do we do this? by being faithful stewards of the resources and the abilities that God has given to all of us. God has given each of us certain resources and abilities, and He expects us to use them for His glory. He expects us to be productive for the kingdom, for the gospel. And when the Master returns, understand, just as the parable describes, because we see this elsewhere in the gospels, we know that when He returns, it will be time to settle accounts The word there, reckoning. There will be a reckoning. The good and the faithful servant will be rewarded with even more. The wicked and the lazy servant will lose everything that he has. So we need to be working while we wait. Because everything that we have comes from God. God expects us to use the resources that He has given to us for His glory. We need to be good and faithful servants, working productively for God's kingdom while we wait for Christ's return. John Charles Ryle, in Expository Thoughts on the Gospels, according to St. Matthew, he said this, and this is how we'll close for today. Quote, Anything whereby we may glorify God is a talent. In quotes. Our gifts, our influence, our money, our knowledge, our health, our strength, our time, our senses, our reason, our intellect, our memory, 
our affections, our privileges as members of Christ's church, our advantages as possessors of the Bible, all, all are talents. Church, see how it is that you can settle into a priority that maintains Christ as head. Prayerfully consider what I just mentioned to you a moment ago. Consider how it is that you can give in the manner in which Char- uh, of John Charles Riley said, think about, Ryle says, think about how it is that you could invest in the work of the kingdom through what you have, which is owned by him 100% in its entirety. And let's lock arms together and let's get busy for the sake of the gospel. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for the wonderful opportunity we've had to be instructed by the truth of your word. And I thank you for the challenge that we have from this parable of the talents. I thank you, Father, that we are able to examine it and understand it and make application to our own lives. I thank you for Calvary Bible Church, Father. But even more than that, I thank you for the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, which changes lives. And I pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified and all of you, stewards of that which you have entrusted to us. Thank you once again. May you be glorified as we respond in song, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.